What if I told you that the most successful locomotive in American history started life as a bus engine? Not a train engine. Not even a truck engine. A bus engine. In 1939, General Motors took a power plant designed for Greyhound coaches and turned it into something that would destroy steam locomotives, bankrupt competitors, and completely revolutionize American railroading. By the time they were done, they'd sold over 7,500 units and captured 75% of the entire locomotive market. This is the story of how GM's F units didn't just beat the competition, they eliminated it. Picture this. It's 1945. You're standing trackside as a massive steam locomotive thunders past, all smoke and fury, dragging a mile-long freight train. The ground shakes. Your chest vibrates from the percussion of the drivers pounding the rails. This is American power personified. A 400-ton monster burning 20 tons of coal and 20,000 gallons of water just to move freight 200 miles. Now imagine someone walks up and says, in 10 years, these will all be gone replaced by something that looks like a streamlined bus. You'd think they were insane. But that's exactly what happened. The F-Unit series wasn't just another diesel locomotive. It was the result of GM's Electromotive Division betting everything on a radical idea, that multiple small, mass-produced engines could outperform one massive custom-built steam locomotive. And they were about to prove that the entire railroad industry had been thinking about locomotives completely wrong for a hundred years. To understand how revolutionary the F unit was, you need to understand what American railroading looked like in 1939. Steam ruled absolutely. The Pennsylvania Railroad alone operated over 7,000 steam locomotives. These weren't machines, they were monuments to mechanical engineering. A typical freight locomotive like the PRR's M1A Mountain weighed 385,000 pounds, developed 64,000 pounds of tractive effort, and could pull a hundred loaded freight cars on level track. Building one took six months and cost $200,000, about $4.2 million in today's money. But here's where it gets interesting. Steam locomotives were essentially handmade. Baldwin Locomotive Works, the industry giant, employed 20,000 workers who custom-built each engine. Every railroad had different requirements, different track gauges, different fuel types, different operating conditions. The New York Central wanted speed for the water level route. The Denver and Rio Grande needed climbing power for the Rockies. Southern Pacific demanded engines that could handle the desert heat. The result? Thousands of unique designs, each one a compromise, each one incompatible with the others. The maintenance situation was even worse. A steam locomotive needed major servicing every 100 to 150 miles. That meant water stops every 30 miles, coaling towers every division point, and an army of skilled workers. The Pennsylvania Railroad employed 15,000 men just to maintain their locomotive, fleet. Boiler washouts every 30 days, complete overhauls every 18 months. And the thermal efficiency, a pathetic 6 to 12%. Most of the energy in that coal went straight up the smokestack. Meanwhile, in LaGrange, Illinois, something completely different was taking shape. General Motors had acquired the Electromotive Corporation in 1930, along with their chief engineer, a Russian immigrant named Eugene Kettering. While the rest of the industry was perfecting steam, Kettering was obsessing over diesel engines. Not for their fuel efficiency, though diesels use 75% less fuel than steam. Not for their reliability, though they could run 100,000 miles between major overhauls. Kettering saw something else entirely, the possibility of mass production. The problem was that diesel technology in the 1930s was crude. Marine diesels were massive, slow-turning monsters. The Mann engines used in German U-boats weighed 40 tons and turned at 450 RPM, way too heavy for a locomotive. Kettering needed something revolutionary, a compact high-speed diesel that could fit in a standard locomotive frame. And that's when a GM's bus division accidentally changed history. In 1938, GM's Detroit diesel division had developed the 671 engine for their new line of transit buses. It was a two-stroke diesel, supercharged, developing 165 horsepower at 1,800 RPM, compact, reliable, and most importantly, mass-produced on an assembly line. Thousands of identical engines, parts completely interchangeable. Kettering looked at this bus engine and saw the future of railroading, but not just one engine. His radical idea was to use multiple engines in a single locomotive, four bus engines working together. Here's where the engineering gets beautiful. 
The EMD 567 engine, scaled up from that bus design, was a masterpiece of simplicity. Two-stroke design meant power on every downstroke, twice the power pulses of a four-stroke. The block was a single casting, 567 cubic inches per cylinder, wet cylinder liners that could be replaced without removing the engine from the locomotive. Unit fuel injectors that combined injection and pumping in one replaceable component. The supercharger was gear-driven off the crankshaft, delivering 4 PSI of boost at full load. The base configuration used 16 cylinders in a 45-degree V layout, bore of 8.5 inches, stroke of 10 inches, compression ratio of 16.1. At 835 RPM, it produced 1,350 horsepower. But here's the clever part. It was modular. Need more power? The same basic engine came in 6, 8, 12, and 16 cylinder versions. Same pistons, same injectors, same maintenance procedures. A railroad mechanic who could work on one could work on them all. The F3 model that really broke the market used the 500 b engine. 16 cylinders displacing 9,072 cubic inches total. The turbocharger spun at 25,000 RPM, cramming air at 10 PSI into those cylinders. Each power assembly, that's the piston, liner, and head unit, weighed 265 pounds and could be changed in two hours. No machine shop required. No specialized tools. Four bolts, two fuel lines, and a water connection. That was it. But an engine is just an engine. What made the F-Unit revolutionary was the complete package. The carbody was stressed skin construction, like an aircraft fuselage. The frame didn't carry the load, the skin did. This saved 15,000 pounds versus traditional construction. The trucks used GM's brilliant Blomberg B design, with a dropped center bolster that lowered the locomotive's center of gravity by 14 inches. Better stability at speed, less weight transfer under acceleration. The electrical system was pure genius. Each 567 engine drove a GM D12 generator producing 600 volts DC at 1,750 amps. That's over a megawatt of electrical power. This fed four GM D27 traction motors, one per axle. Each motor developed 40,000 pounds starting tractive effort, limited only by wheel adhesion. The control system used GM's new transition system. At low speeds, the motors were wired in series for maximum torque. As speed increased, they automatically transitioned to series parallel, then full parallel configuration. No clutches, no gearboxes, just smooth, continuous power delivery from 0 to 65 miles per hour. Now, here's the kicker. While Baldwin and Lima were still hand-building custom locomotives, GM set up the Lagrange plant for mass production. The assembly line could turn out three complete F units per day, every unit identical, every part interchangeable. They weren't building locomotives, they were manufacturing them. The production line had 23 stations. Station 1, frame assembly. Station 5, engine installation. Station 14, electrical systems. Station 23, final testing. Start to finish, 10 days versus 6 months for a steam locomotive. The cost difference was staggering. A steam locomotive, $200,000 and unique to each railroad. An F3A unit, $152,000 and identical whether sold to the Pennsylvania, Santa Fe, or Great Northern. Need parts? GM stocked them in warehouses nationwide, breakdown in Montana. The parts from a unit in Florida would fit perfectly. This wasn't just a new locomotive, it was a new business model. So what was actually going wrong with steam that made railroads desperate enough to try this bus engine experiment? Everything. By 1945, the average steam locomotive was available for service only 35% of the time. The other 65% in the shop taking on water, loading coal, or cooling down for mandatory boiler inspections. A typical run from Chicago to Los Angeles required 15 water stops and six complete crew changes. The F unit, fuel in Los Angeles, runs straight through to Chicago. Same crew for the entire 2,200 mile journey. The Santa Fe ran the first real test that shocked everyone. September 1940. They put EMD's FT demonstrator set four units developing 5,400 horsepower against their best steam locomotive on Rayton Pass. The grade 3.5% for 17 miles climbing from 6,400 to 7,600 feet. The steam locomotive a massive 484 Northern could pull 26 cars up the grade at 10 miles per hour. The FT set, 66 cars at 26 miles per hour, more than double the tonnage at more than double the speed. 
But wait, there's more. The steam engine burned 38 tons of coal and 34,000 gallons of water, making that climb. The FT used 380 gallons of diesel fuel. Operating cost per ton mile, steam at 187, diesel at 034. The Santa Fe ordered 320 FT units on the spot, the largest locomotive order in history at that point. The real genius was multiple unit operation. Steam locomotives couldn't work together. You needed one crew per engine. But F units? Connect them with GM's 27-point jumper cables, and one engineer could control a dozen units as a single locomotive. The Pensy tested this to destruction. 12 F units in a single consist, developing 18,000 horsepower. They pulled a 15,000-ton coal train, that's 175 loaded hoppers, up the Allegheny grade without helpers. One engineer, one fireman, 12 engines working in perfect synchronization. Performance metrics tell the full story. Availability, steam at 35%, F units at 93%, monthly mileage, steam average 3,000 miles, F units average 12,000. Fuel cost per 1,000 ton miles, steam at $45, diesel at $8. Maintenance cost, steam needed one shop worker for every three locomotives, diesels needed one for every 20. Water consumption, zero for diesels versus 20,000 gallons per 100 miles for steam. The numbers weren't just better, they were from a different universe. By 1949, railroads were ordering F units faster than GM could build them. The production line at Lagrange ran three shifts seven days a week. They built specialized variants, the F7 with 1,500 horsepower 567B engines, the F9 with 1,250 horsepower 567C engines. The FP7 stretched by four feet for passenger service with larger steam generators. The F3 alone sold 1,807 units. The F7 moved 3,149 units. These weren't sales. This was conquest. Let me put that in perspective. Baldwin Locomotive Works, the company that built 70,000 steam locomotives over 125 years, tried to compete with their DR4415 diesel. It used a Delavernia engine designed for tugboats weighed 40,000 pounds more than an F unit, and broke down constantly. They sold 127 units total before admitting defeat. Lima Hamilton's attempt was even worse. Their diesel used a Hamilton engine originally designed for U.S. Navy submarines. The crankshaft alone weighed 4,000 pounds and required a crane to service. They sold 36 units before going bankrupt. The numbers speak for themselves. Between 1939 and 1960, EMD sold 7,612 F units, they captured 75% of the North American locomotive market. Revenue, $1.2 billion, that's $14 billion adjusted for inflation. Baldwin went bankrupt in 1956, Lima disappeared in 1951, Alco held on until 1969. The entire steam locomotive industry, which had existed for 130 years, was dead within a decade, killed by a bus engine. But the real story wasn't just sales, it was transformation. The F unit changed how railroads operated. Steam-era railroads needed infrastructure every 30 miles, water towers, coaling facilities, ash pits, roundhouses. The Illinois Central alone maintained 147 coaling towers across their system, all obsolete overnight. They demolished them, sold the land, and used the money to buy more F units. The workforce changed too. Steam engineers were craftsmen who knew their individual engines by sound and feel. Diesel engineers became systems operators, managing electronics and air brakes. The strategic impact was even bigger. Steam locomotives were territorial. Each railroad's engines worked only on home rails. But F units were universal. The Southern Pacific's units could run on Great Northern Track, pull Baltimore and Ohio cars, and be serviced in a Pensy shop. This enabled run-through agreements, pooled power arrangements, and ultimately, the merger movement that created today's Class 1 railroads. The F unit didn't just replace steam, it made the modern railroad industry possible. There's a fascinating technical epilogue. The 567 engine was so well designed that it stayed in production for 50 years. The final version, the 645F, developed 3,500 horsepower from the same basic architecture. Total production, over 35,000 engines. They powered not just locomotives, but also marine vessels, stationary generators, and even some military vehicles. The U.S. Navy's Fletcher-class destroyers used 567 engines for auxiliary power. The same engine pulling freight trains was powering warships. That's engineering excellence. The human cost of this revolution was significant. In 1945, American railroads employed 1.4 million people, mostly in steam locomotive maintenance. 
By 1960, that number had dropped to 600,000. Entire towns built around railroad shops disappeared. Altoona, Pennsylvania, home to the Pensy's massive Juniata shops, lost 20,000 jobs in five years. The Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen fought desperately to require firemen on diesel locomotives, even though there was no fire to tend. They lost. Progress has a price. Yet some technical problems persisted. Early F units had a critical flaw. The dynamic brakes could overheat on long descents. The resistor grids mounted in the roof would literally melt if overused. Southern Pacific, descending from Donner Summit, learned this the hard way. Runaway trains, destroyed equipment, and two fatal accidents before GM developed water-cooled resistor grids. Even revolutionary technology has growing pains. Modern perspective makes the F unit's achievement even more impressive. Today's AC traction locomotives like the GE Evolution series develop 4,400 horsepower and use 200 gallons of fuel per 1,000 ton miles. The F3 from 1945, 1,350 horsepower and 280 gallons per 1,000 ton miles. In 75 years, we've improved fuel efficiency by just 28%. The fundamental efficiency gain happened in one leap from steam to diesel and it was the F unit that made that leap. The last revenue F unit ran in 1989 on the Georgia Central Railway. 40 years of service from a design created for transit buses. Today, over 100 F units survive in museums and tourist operations. The California State Railroad Museum's Southern Pacific 6402 still runs excursions. You can ride behind the same technology that revolutionized American railroading. Stand next to one and you'll notice something interesting. It's smaller than you'd expect, just 50 feet long, 15 feet tall. A steam locomotive dwarfs it, but inside that streamlined shell was the future. Here's something to consider. The F unit succeeded not because it was the most powerful or the fastest or even the most advanced locomotive. It succeeded because GM understood something the traditional builders didn't. Railroads didn't need custom engineering masterpieces. They needed reliable, economical, mass-produced tools. The F unit was the Model T of locomotives. Not the best, but good enough cheap enough, and available enough to change everything. The philosophical takeaway runs deeper than transportation. The F unit represents a fundamental shift in American industrial thinking, from craftsmanship to manufacturing, from custom to standardized, from mechanical art to economic efficiency. It's the same transformation that happened in automobiles, aircraft, and eventually computers. The F unit didn't just dieselize American railroads, it proved that mass production could conquer any industry, no matter how entrenched. Think about that for a second. One company, with one basic engine design scaled from buses, completely eliminated an entire industry that had existed since 1825. They didn't do it with superior technology, European diesels were more advanced, they didn't do it with government support, steam builders had massive political influence, they did it with mass production, interchangeable parts, and relentless standardization. The same formula Henry Ford used for cars applied to locomotives. In the end, the F unit's legacy isn't just about trains, it's about how radical simplification can destroy complexity, how mass production can eliminate craftsmanship, how a bus engine, properly applied, can revolutionize an entire nation's transportation infrastructure. Every intermodal container moving across America today rides on rails because the F unit made freight railroading economically viable. That Amazon package that arrived yesterday? Thank a bus engine from 1938. What's the most revolutionary piece of repurposed technology you've ever encountered? Let me know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this deep dive into how GM conquered American railroading with bus engines, make sure to subscribe. Next time, we're examining how a rejected aircraft engine became the most successful tank power plant in history. Until then, keep those...